Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I am Laura Dixon with Spurs Sports and Entertainment, and also I currently serve as the Texas Lyceum President. It is Thursday, September 10th, 2020, and just a little after 8 a.m. Central Standard Time. It has been an honor for me to work with Michelle Lugalia Holland, Chairman Dave Phelan, and Amanda Saldana on this important topic and concern for our Texas leaders. I am proud of their teamwork and thoughtful planning. Dade, thank you for hosting us in virtual Beaumont. Well, thank you, Laura. Um, howdy, fellow uh, Lyceumites, alumni, and guests. Uh, I'm at the Mark Styles unit here in Beaumont, Texas, to virtually welcome you to my hometown of Beaumont. I wish we could all be in here uh, together in person to explore Southeast Texas food, music, sites, and culture. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that in this, in this day and age. Uh, I hope you're all staying healthy and safe at home. But uh, as always, at Lyceum, uh, you know, we adapt and we overcome. And so we're able to put together a really uh, interactive, unique uh, conference. I want to thank the staff at Lyceum, my fellow chairs, and the committee chairs for for overcoming uh, these obstacles and producing a, just a really wonderful conference. I plan to meet you uh, today uh, at the Stiles Unit with my county judges and my mayors and my sheriffs. But unfortunately, due to Hurricane Laura, they are, um, they're taking care of business back home. So again, welcome virtually to Beaumont and uh, look forward to our wonderful conference. Texas is home to over 700 prisons and jails. These systems require complex infrastructure, a skilled workforce, and a variety of public and private providers to operate the multi-billion dollar system efficiently. So how exactly is Texas economy impacted by the facet of criminal, of this facet of the criminal justice system? Together, we will learn and discuss the history, legislation, data trends, ethics, and priorities that shape and impact the business of incarceration in the Lone Star State. We have a terrific lineup of experts, policymakers, elected officials, advocates, and legislative leaders who will increase our awareness of a variety of matters that shape and influence the business of incarceration in Texas. This year's fellow from Texas Tech, an exciting new partnership for the Lyceum, will guide us through the history of the growth of prisons, jails, and detention centers over time. Criminal justice, will detail the cost of operating our statewide prison system. Through a discussion with legislative leaders, we will explore how current trends in criminal justice reform might impact the business of incarceration. And we are honored to learn directly from formerly incarcerated criminal justice advocates in dialogue with policy experts on the future of incarceration and its implications on, you guessed it, the business of incarceration. In the spirit of the Lyceum, we are especially excited to facilitate two ethics exercises, which we hope will give each of us a chance to connect, debate, and deepen our inquiry around this topic. So come ready to explore and engage. I wish you were all here and welcome to Virtual Beaumont. We will miss being with you in person. 2020 has surely proven to be a year of change and innovation. Thank you for embracing Thank you to our fantastic committee, which has helped us power through and make this the best virtual experience for you all. Bruce Rideau, Creighton Webb, Glenwood Hill, Joanna Ridgway, Johnny Sutton, Carmen Bryant, Kevin Roberts, Molly Quirk, Sarah Jackson, Terry Bruner, Thomas Miranda, and Tim Glass. Thank you for everything that you've done to make this a success. Michelle, thank you. Amanda, thank you. Dade, thank you. I wish we were all together too. Um, committee, uh, friends, sponsors, we all appreciate you sticking with us this year in 2020 and helping us continue to deliver the important conversations and content to Texas leaders. It is my distinct pleasure as a Red Raider to introduce you to our next speaker, Texas Tech University President Skuvenek, who will come to us live from Lubbock, Texas, and introduce Abigail Wesson, our fellow for 2020, who has done um, some incredible research, and um, she will present that to us also live from the campus of Texas Tech University. Um, Dr. Skuvenek, we appreciate your, your commitment and sponsorship. Thank you. A new level of ambition and excellence thrives at the Texas Tech system. 
a $2 billion higher education enterprise with four diverse and distinguished universities. Because from here, it's possible. Thank you, Laura. We are proud that you're a member of the Red Raider family and congratulations on your leadership role within the Texas Lyceum. Texas Tech is pleased to be a Lyceum sponsor and our alumni have been involved with the organization throughout its 40 year history. In particular, the late Rex Fuller was a founding member of the Texas Lyceum, a Lubbock native, a graduate of Texas Tech and a former member of our Board of Regents. You don't have to look very far to find a Red Raider who has served the Lyceum as a director or alumni. Lubbock was honored to host the Texas Lyceum's meeting in January of 20, 2009 and then again in October of 2018. And we appreciated the opportunity to showcase Texas Tech's support of agriculture and natural resources and the benefits of these industries in providing food, fiber, and energy, not only for Texas, but the nation. As Texas Tech approaches its 100th birthday in 2023, we have the distinction of being the largest comprehensive higher education institution in the western two-thirds of the state. This fall, Texas Tech will attain a record enrollment for the 12th consecutive year. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, students continue to seek a Texas Tech education in increasing numbers because of the brand and the value of the university but also because they desire the face-to-face -face learning experience. And our faculty and staff have worked hard this spring to deliver the teaching modalities that meet our students' needs. We are among 131 universities in the nation that enjoy tier one status as a very high research activity university in the Carnegie classification of institutions of higher ed and one of only 94 public institutions on that list. Today, we have 13 colleges and schools and offer more than 150 undergraduate and 100 graduate and doctoral programs. We are especially proud that Texas Tech's impact and service to West Texas and the state will be expanded when the School of Veterinary Medicine welcomes its first class in August of 2021. If you've not had the opportunity to visit recently, I'd like to take a moment to show you around our university. I hope you enjoy the tour of Texas Tech University. It's now my pleasure to introduce your Texas Lyceum Fellow, Abigail Wesson. Abigail is a graduate student at Texas Tech pursuing her degree in social work and public administration. Joining Abigail is her graduate advisor, Dr. Nathaniel Wright, who also leads our Master of Public Administration program. We value the Lyceum's partnership and research investment in graduate students. Please help me welcome Abigail for her research presentation. Good morning. My name is Abigail Wesson. While I'm disappointed we are unable to be together in person, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be a part of the inaugural Texas Lyceum virtual conference series. Under the advisement of Dr. Nathaniel Wright, I've had the high honor of serving as one of the Texas Lyceum Fellows for this year. My goal for the fellowship was to create a policy brief focusing on the business of incarceration. Over the past few months, I've conducted interviews with several professionals across the state, including many Lyceum directors and alumni who have given me valuable insight into the Texas prison system that I hope to share with you all today. Rapid prison population growth in the late 1980s permanently expanded government partnerships with private corporations, nonprofits, and other public agencies, generating an industry of incarceration. As a result, legislators and administrators faced challenges to ensure accountability, 
coordination, and efficiency among numerous organizations with conflicting goals. Leveraging private partnerships within the Texas Prison System reflects cost-effective policy solutions to improve service delivery and reduce recidivism. From 1978 to 2010, the number of individuals incarcerated in Texas increased a staggering 541%. In addition to national movements, two state-level initiatives caused palpable spikes in inmate populations. In 1979, Texas established a Drug Abuse Advisory Council, which enacted the strictest drug possession sentencing requirements in the nation. In 1993, Texas legislators revised the penal code to address high violent crime rates. These changes doubled the amount of time violent offenders must serve before becoming eligible for parole. In 2007, the Texas prison population was projected to increase by 17,000 over the next five years, requiring $2 billion for additional facility construction. Instead of investing in prison expansion, legislators enacted the Texas Justice Reinvestment Act, increasing funding for several community-based treatment and diversion programs. Marking a turning point in Texas, inmate populations have steadily declined since 2011. However, Texas continues to hold one of the highest incarceration rates in the nation, causing multifaceted consequences affecting generations of Texas residents. The prominent racial disparities within the Texas prison system reveal institutionalized inequities and systemic discriminatory practices with pervasive ramifications. Additionally, recent studies show individuals incarcerated for as few as three days experience a detrimental impact on employment, financial stability, housing, and one's ability to adequately support dependents. The cost of operating the Texas prison system is becoming increasingly unsustainable. Expanding 300% in 30 years, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice incarceration budget reaches a record high of $3 billion despite recent reductions in inmate populations. Prison privatization, the economic repercussions of prison labor, and the expansion of service contracting highlight three critical aspects of the industry of incarceration to thoroughly analyze. In the 1990s, prison corporations gained momentum in response to the state's lack of inmate capacity. Proposed as an efficient and economical solution, private prisons held 12% of Texas prisoners in 2008. Incarceration rate declines over the past decade reduced the number of offenders in private prisons by 60%, but budget allocations to prison corporations reduced only by 13%. Despite claims of significant cost savings, recent studies fail to prove increased efficiency among private facilities. Several states recently banned private prison contracts due to the potentially perverse intentions of for-profit models, impacting living standards and safety. Texas Correctional Industries originated in 1963 following the Prison Make Goods Act, allowing Texas inmates to manufacture goods and provide services for public organizations. Processing over 12,000 outside customer orders in 2018, Texas Correctional industry sales generated nearly $77 million in profit in addition to the cost savings of utilizing inmate labor for prison operations. The statutory objectives of Texas Correctional Industries are to provide work program participants with marketable job skills, help reduce recidivism, and reduce department cost. However, there are minimal job prospects for the manufacturing goods and services that inmates provide. The national dialogue surrounding prison labor questions the ethics of this program, where Texas is one of only five states refusing to compensate offenders for their work. The 13th Amendment abolished involuntary servitude in 1865, but the law included an exception for individuals convicted of crimes subject to forced unpaid labor. Last legislative session, a bill proposing paying inmates merely a dollar a day for their work failed to gain traction, even though Texas Correctional Industries would continue to profit $45 million per year. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice relies on numerous private vendors to supply additional goods and services necessary for prison operations. During 2018, they processed nearly 50,000 purchase orders and facilitated over 500 contracts. Texas Tech University Health Science Center and the University of Texas Medical Branch provide healthcare services for all Texas prisoners by subcontracting with additional private vendors across the state. 
Despite prison populations steadily declining, healthcare expenses have increased 41% since 2012. Correctional healthcare represents 25% of the Texas incarceration budget, encroaching $700 million. One factor influencing medical expenditures is the dramatic rise of the aging population in Texas prisons, where the percentage of inmates over 50 has more than quadrupled since 1975. With 47% of correctional health care spending allocated to psychiatric services, the most significant contributor to budget growth is the prevalence of mental illness among inmates. Arguably underreported, over half of all adults incarcerated in the U.S are diagnosed with at least one mental health condition, with the majority suffering from a severe mental illness, making the prison system the largest mental health provider in the nation. Even though Texas has not fully privatized commissary operations, vendors generate significant profit from inmate purchases. Keith, a large commissary company, made nearly $19 million from Texas prisoners in 2017. Additionally, Citibank generated $6 million in revenue solely from transaction fees and other digital services. A 15-minute phone call in a Texas county jail costs $17.25, the sixth highest rate in the nation, not, to include, not including additional transaction fees. With over 71% of Texans in jail awaiting sentencing, this high price tag not only exacerbates economic disparities, but makes it difficult for inmates to stay connected with loved ones, which is crucial for successful reentry. Through a competitive bidding process, the cost of a phone call in Texas prisons recently reduced from nearly $4 to 90 cents. CenturyLink receives 60% of this charge, averaging 1.5 million calls per month. Approaching the 87th legislative session, significant economic uncertainty prompted the governor to issue an immediate 5% budget reduction across all state agencies. The Texas Department of Criminal Justice successfully cut expenditures by over $129 million by addressing excess inmate capacity and prioritizing prison closures. Permanently reducing prison populations requires ensuring low recidivism rates, where over half of ex-offenders are rearrested. Texas lawmakers face unique budgetary restraints, limiting funding for opportunities for reentry program expansion. The following policy recommendations involve leveraging partnerships within the industry of incarceration to enact cost-effective solutions for promoting successful reentry. The recent reduction of prison phone call prices highlight a primary benefit of privatization, where a competitive bidding process resulted in a significant opportunity to lower costs and improve services. Capitalizing on privatization through strategic contract negotiations ensures accountability and mutually beneficial partnerships. Texas lawmakers should require prison administrators to negotiate the inclusion of high-speed broadband services in all contracts with telecommunication companies and privately operated prisons. Increasing technology access expands several different online programs without requiring additional funding. Prison healthcare providers recently partnered with Global Med to provide telehealth consultations, saving $3 million by not having to transport offenders or providers. Currently deployed in 30 facilities, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice should expand this program to the remaining 70 facilities, especially in rural prisons lacking the technology required to facilitate video conferencing. This proposal will reduce inmate transfers, improve public safety, increase efficiency, and provide inmates with a high standard of medical care. Employment is one of the most critical and influential factors in reducing recidivism, where stable income directly impacts housing, access to health care, and the ability to support dependents. As a stipulation of criminal supervision, failure to maintain employment may result in reincarceration, preventing inmates from becoming employees, taxpayers, and consumers. Where thousands of inmates participate in Texas correctional industries without pay, only 80 inmates are selected for the Prison Industry Enhancement Certification Program. This program allows private companies to employ offenders for almost $10 an hour. With only two private partnerships, state lawmakers should explore policies allowing for the expansion of the certification program to include additional businesses across the state. 
targeting employers that develop trade skills and provide vocational certifications for inmates advances their economic capacity and improves their likelihood of securing a livable wage after release. Developing additional partnerships with the private sector reflects an effective strategy for reducing recidivism, promoting economic vitality, and advancing Texas's workforce. With 73% of Texas counties lacking a psychiatrist, the limited access to mental health care in Texas presents several challenges for the criminal justice system, as well as the millions of Texans residing in rural counties. Developing partnerships to increase the immediacy of mental health treatment after intake and following release addresses the state's growing pretrial population and promotes permanent reentry. The Mental Health Grant for Justice Involved Individuals was introduced in 2017, which funds matching grants for county-based community collaboratives to reduce recidivism among individuals with mental illness. With increased arrest for possession of controlled substances and the high recidivism rates of drug offenses, Texas legislators should consider expanding this model across the state to build capacity among local stakeholders, identify gaps in services, and create plans for expedited service delivery. Moreover, developing partnerships with universities presents a cost-effective approach to coordinate additional mental health services for inmates, improve continuity of care after release, and promote the Texas Loan Repayment Program to grow the state's mental health workforce. Universities are able to provide students and mental health programs with educational opportunities to complete licensure requirements by conducting telehealth sessions with inmates and continuing treatment three months after their release. Addressing the mental health workforce shortage increases access to mental health care across the state and ensures ex-offenders have immediate treatment options while navigating the difficult transition into society. In closing, focusing on collaboration and coordination among the numerous public and private organizations involved in the Texas justice system to increase access for mental health care and stable employment continues the downward trend of prison populations, lessens the economic burden of incarceration, and provides critical support to populations that are most vulnerable to rearrest. Thank you all for providing me with the opportunity to speak with you today. My full policy brief is available online on the Texas Lyceum Fellowship page. I look forward to sharing more about my research following this presentation through discussion with Sarah Jackson, the Vice President of the Fellowship Program. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And we are here live in the Hub City, also known as Lubbock, Texas. We are excited that you could join us this morning. I am Sarah Jackson, the Vice President of Policy Fellowship for the Texas Lyceum. I'm joined here with our inaugural fellow from Texas Tech, Miss Abigail Wesson. <laughs> Yay! I put my guns up, but my Aggie friends would get so mad at me, I think. <laughs> hey, I understand. Uh, yeah, no, it's all good. It's all good. So let's talk a little bit about your research and just dive into it a bit more. And so I think the most interesting thing, things people might want to know about you is you're our first fellow from Texas Tech and our first fellow from West Texas. Right. So tell <laughs> us about that experience and what has it been like being a Texas Lyceum Fellow? Sure, well, there's definitely been no pressure at all being the inaugural fellow. Um, I did not have the opportunity to come to Texas Tech for my undergrad, so I came here for my graduate school career. Initially started in the social work department and really quickly realized I'm drawn to more macro level policy issues and was really recruited into the Masters of Public Administration program here at Tech. Whenever I heard of the opportunity, not only of the Texas Lyceum, Lyceum, but also the topic of incarceration. That's been something that has guided my research ever since I've been a part of this program in social work and public administration. So the opportunity to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to speak to so many different professionals across the state and gain insight that is, you know, very different than just being in a classroom or reading from a textbook. It was an invaluable opportunity to gain more insight and really have those who are doing this every day, who are living, breathing 
um, being a part of the Texas prison system and how we can propose practical solutions moving forward. I've had so much support from Texas Tech, which has yeah. been a really unique experience. While I know I'm very disappointed we were not able to be in Beaumont in person, having this at Texas Tech and feeling that camaraderie of the Lyceum as well as Red Raiders has been something that I will not forget and it's been a really important part of my academic career. Yeah. You have touched <laughs> my heart this morning, Abigail. Um, we have thoroughly, and we'll get to that later in the conversation, enjoyed working with you. And you have been a just outstanding uh, inaugural fellow from Texas Tech. Um, you know, people sing your praises everywhere. And so you've been amazing. Thank you so and much. so uh, thank you for sharing all that about the fellowship. Mm -hmm. As uh, many of you know, the fellowship is only a few years old, and so we're so proud to be bringing it out here, and thank you for that experience, because you, what you describe is sort of how it personally impacted you, but then the work, and so let's get to your work. You know, I know this topic, the business <laughs> of incarceration, what does that mean, right? It's probably a what a lot of, question. what yes. does that mean? <laughs> um, you know, it was probably not the easiest thing. It sure. wasn't like, tell me about the history of social work. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that probably would have been an easier <laughs> lift for you. Uh, so why don't you share with everybody, uh, what were some of the challenges that you encountered when, you know, Terry Bruner and I, who's the incoming policy uh, vice president for fellowships, as many of you know, for Lyceum, Terry, thank you for all your support, and, and we so enjoy working with you. Yes. But tell us, when Terry and I reached out to you, you know, earlier with, mm -hmm. you know, Dr. Nathaniel Wright, your supervising professor, and said, hey, the meeting chairs are president, this is kind of the, you know, level, this is what we want to talk about. When we yeah. said business of incarceration, <laughs> tell us about the journey and the challenges that you encountered in trying to do that. Sure. So, you know, my first love, if you will, is social work. And I think I very naturally gravitated towards really looking at the social implications of incarceration. Um, I think whenever I first submitted, you know, the first of many revised research outlines to you all, really looking at what's the true cost of incarceration and kind of highlighting how you have social implications and you also have economic implications. And, you know, I think sometimes it's very easy for individuals, academics, legislators, administrators to delineate those two topics. If you have social implications and you have economic implications. And ironically, a lot of times party lines mm -hmm. sometimes lean more towards one of those as well. And I think not only from my research, but really diving into a lot of the interviews in analyzing a lot of the data, you know, we see how social and economic implications are completely intertwined and fuel off of one another and have incredibly impactful ramifications to individuals, to families, and to the broader community. Um, so even for example, take employment, right? That was one thing that we, yeah. that we focused on in our research, looking how it, it's so difficult and there's so many barriers to those who have a criminal history finding um, not just employment, but finding employment that has a livable wage, right? And that changes so so differently across the nation. Um, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes look at that as solely a social issue, right? That that affects their dependence, that affects their ability to adequately support their children, that affects housing, but it also affects their income capacity and their economic capacity. If they're not able to gain um, willful employment, they are unable to become taxpayers, they're unable to become um, employees as well as consumers. So that is something that you know, even I think it was a, a United States statistic that just because of the subtle employment, unemployment rate change of those who have a criminal history, mm -hmm. that cost our economy almost $89 billion a year. And granted, when we look at high incarceration rates in Texas, we know that that actually affects the Texas economy a little bit more than maybe some other states. So I think that is such a, an important um, challenge as well as lesson when we start engaging in policy discussions of we don't have to delineate between social and economic. There really are intertwined, there's prominent similarities, and looking at both is the best opportunity to propose actually policy solutions that will work and provide the most significant impact. No, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So it, I, now, since you were talking about the social and economic mm -hmm. sort of partnership, sure. I want to talk about the partnerships that you spoke mm -hmm. about and you recommended in your research. Mm -hmm. um, we really love the fact that a lot of your policy recommendations focus not on, you know, TDCJ needs mm -hmm. to do X, Y, Z. 
it was like these partnerships, these mm -hmm. public private partnerships that the state could look at in order to start to lean into this business of incarceration mm -hmm. issue and the economics of it specifically sure. to your point. So tell us more about why the partnership recommendations and why you think they're so important for the state to move mm -hmm. forward on this issue. Absolutely. And, you know, I think whenever one of the first interview questions I asked a lot of the um, administrators and legislators that I spoke with um, was, you know, what, what are your thoughts on the business of incarceration? What are your first thoughts on, on that topic? And, you know, I think there is an assumption that maybe, you know, whether it was this topic or my presentation or my research was really going to focus on, you know, this prison industrial complex where, you know, Texas is, is profiting off of the prison industry. And why, yes, there are a lot of private organizations involved in our prison system. The main goal that the Texas Department of Criminal Justice utilizes all these different private vendors is for efficiency, to provide a better product and to be able to um, fulfill prison operations um, as cost efficiently as possible. And, you know, when we're looking at, mm -hmm. to me, I look at instead of just the business, like we have, you know, this person who is just profiting from prison, it's really more this complex infrastructure of utilizing a, a mixture of private, nonprofit, and public organizations to come together to not just within the Texas justice system, but within incarceration, and then also after release. So that was really what focused, number one, my focus on recidivism and making sure that we are providing support and resources to offenders after they're incarcerated. But also this was a huge challenge of 2020, one of many <laughs> challenges we've all this faced in 2020. What? I know, it's <laughs> crazy. Um, but being able to, you know, the G Governor Abbott stated a mandatory 5% budget cut across all state agencies, while there were some exceptions for critical functions within the Texas Absolutely. Department of Criminal Justice. You know, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice depleted their budget by $129 million just this year by looking at some of the excess capacity within prisons because of the steady inmate decline and closing prisons. So in order for us to make that permanent, we have to focus on recidivism, right? We have mm -hmm. to make sure that if we want this trajectory to continue, we have to look at recidivism. So also kind of getting back to partnerships, you know, we don't have the opportunity. It would, it would have been impractical and um, I think someone would probably rolled their eyes if I, my policy recommendations were proposing all these new programs with all of this additional funding that should be <laughs> allocated the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. You know, I think we kind of have to face the reality that we might be cutting budgets for a couple more years. And how do we look at a lot of these partnerships, see how we can um, look at the gaps and identify gaps, identify overlap, build capacity within these organizations to provide improved services, to provide more services and support for um, men and women who are reentering society and be able to kind of leverage what we already have to provide these cost-effective solutions, but per still provide more services. No, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Well, to our uh, Texas Lyceum directors, mm -hmm. alumni, and guests who are joining us from all over, I'm mm -hmm. sure the United States, and Gen uh, it, Ginger, if you're out there, I'm sure you're, if you're in Switzerland, hello to you. Mm -hmm. Um, we, before we get to questions is what I wanted to stop out and say, I'm going to ask Abigail one more mm -hmm. question, but please get ready uh, to send us your questions. It's best to send them through the chat and then we will try to get to as many questions as we can um, before we close here in Lubbock, uh, also known as the Hub City. Mm -hmm. And so my last question to you, uh, Abigail, mm -hmm. um, your, your brief, your policy brief is available, your presentation was outstanding. Um, just sort of the one thing, you know, again, part of what Terry and I talked with you about when we, you know, first started charting out this research was how can this work, mm. you know, really move the needle on this issue in our state, but then the bigger takeaway is why is this important, right? And so as we kind of think about that sort of final, you know, what are you going to leave us with? You know, why do you think your work is important to uh, this issue related to Texas public policy? And, you know, yeah, why is it important to our state? I'll leave it there. <laughs> I can't speak on this for a, a very significant amount of time, but I know our time is limited. To me, without sounding rather alarmist, to me, these are necessary and 
required solutions for us to, again, continue this downward trajectory of incarceration in Texas, right? 2007 really marked this turning point for Texas of instead of investing in facility construction, we invested in um, the Justice Reinvestment Act to have more community treatment programs, to have really increased prison diversion programs. And what we saw is that really was what absolutely called a palpable decrease in inmate populations. And because of that, we need to learn from what policies have worked in the past, learn from maybe what policies have not worked in the past, and looking at this complex infrastructure that is already created within the Texas prison system, and instilling coordination and collaboration to move the state forward in a way that is economical, and also a way that provides valuable resources for mental health care, as well as employment for the populations that are most vulnerable to rearrest. And with that, <laughs> our fellow from Texas Tech University, Abigail Wesson, uh, will kind of halt the conversation here. And uh, I see a very lovely comment from David Kim out of <laughs> Houston, thank you, uh, saying that everything is going well. Uh, I don't see any questions. I think we had some coming. And so I will ask Abigail one more mm -hmm. question. And y'all, I, I know we are not a shy group. Uh, we've all told Dr. Wright and uh, Abigail about the inquisitory nature of our uh, Texas Lyceum family. So mm -hmm. any questions that come to mind related to this research, uh, this is something, again, we've partnered with Texas Tech mm -hmm. on. We will continue to par partner with them next year. And we hope that you found this research uh, to be interesting and a different take on uh, the issue of business of incarceration in our mm -hmm. state. And so uh, with that, I do mm -hmm. see a question from Brett Piott, and it says the prison population, which is now uh, at any point in time, do we have data on how many people spend one or more days incarcerated each year? That's a great question. And I, I'm afraid if I were to cite that statistic right now, it would potentially be inaccurate. Um, <laughs> but I do know what was interesting is, you know, we have the Texas prison system. And I'll be honest, I did not understand all of these subtle changes. Or again, I feel like I've said the word complex several times, but it genuinely is an incredibly complex and multifaceted system. But we also have county jails that are not necessarily included in you know, some of the prison numbers or statistics that we were talking about. And in Texas, you know, we do have prison and jail populations that are steadily declining, but the number one population in Texas in jail that has increased is our pretrial population. So 71% of inmates held in Texas County jails are held for pretrial. And, you know, we see too that even inmates who have been held for as few as three days have detrimental impacts on employment, income, potentially recidivism, a rearrest in the future, right? And that's only, that's only three days. So how do we really also not only invest in reentry services, but a lot of the um, things that we would invest in from employment to mental health care that also works as prison diversion, especially for those who have been incarcerated in the past. How do we prevent that rearrest? Criminal supervision can be a very difficult and technical, timely and costly process. So how within our communities can we create a more fertile environment for individuals to enter into that promotes success and not a violation of parole or probation and potential rearrest? Thank you. Hopefully that answered your question, Brett, and thank you mm -hmm. for the question. Um, the next one I see is from Debbie Newman, and mm -hmm. your question is uh, to you, Abigail, mm -hmm. can you give examples of policies that have worked uh, maybe in other places mm -hmm. and that we could build on as a state? Absolutely, and you know, a lot of the research and policy recommendations that I spoke on have been used in other states and have been used really well. Even for example, you know, we, one of the recommendations was to build more collaborative networks in communities. This is a, you know, I know I'm speaking to lawmakers, but especially for all of you in your local communities, creating these community collaboratives that focus on mental health is an incredible way for us to, you know, reduce the time of whenever someone is released from prison, the amount of time that they connected with a local mental health authority. You know, we, yes, we have probation offers, 
probation officers that or parole officers that help connect with community resources, but really identifying in your community what different public, nonprofit, private organizations provide these services, how do we increase access to these individuals so that when they do become released, they have an opportunity to thrive and we have, you know, a open and welcoming environment for them to come into and we're providing them with those mental health resources um, that they receive mental health treatment in prison, but whenever they, you know, come out to release, sometimes they're missing that support. So how do we rally our community organizations and identify those local stakeholders to get around a table together and figure out how in their community that they can build capacity to make sure that there are more opportunities available. Um, I have, I could speak on that more if we want to jump to another question. That was just kind yeah, of we, one, one example. We do. And um, mm -hmm. I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ask you a question that came from uh, our first, yeah. our board chairman, mm -hmm. Sanjay Ramabhadran awesome. out of Houston. <laughs> Thank you, Sanjay. He's curious to know, what do you, what are you doing next? <laughs> what's your, what's, the, what's for you after graduation in December? You want to share with everybody? That's a great question. So, you know, it's really a unique opportunity that not only was I able to be part of the Lyceum Fellowship, an incredible opportunity, um, but Texas Tech allowed this to be my last course in the Master of Public Administration program. So I graduated my master's in social work in May. I'm finishing up my MPA. So, you know, in the world of virtual graduation ceremonies, this is a pretty monu monumental way to close my academic career. It would definitely say that this has been the most challenging, but by far the most rewarding aspect of my educational career. Um, but next, my, um, my wonderful husband, he is in law school right now, finishing up his last year. He had the opportunity to have a summer associate position in DC over the summer. So we actually, he um, was blessed enough to be able to be given an offer at the end of the summer. So we will be headed to DC in the summer. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. uh, I'm glad you shared <laughs> that. Um, as we all know, the Lyceum Network is far mm -hmm. and wide. Uh, if anyone of you out there have any suggestions yes. or leads, job leads in particular for our uh, fellow here from Texas Tech, Abigail Wesson, uh, please reach out to her. Yes. Uh, her mm -hmm. information is on your platform. And if you can't reach her, reach out to Terry Bruner myself. We would be happy to put you in touch with her, but we would love any job leads, suggestions, contacts mm -hmm. that she can meet out in DC. But 100%. this is a, yeah, this is a dream uh, career mm -hmm. for her. So um, hopefully we can help bring this dream to life. Mm -hmm. uh, Lubbock is the largest city I've ever lived in. So <laughs> okay. moving to Washington, DC, any, any connections, job opportunities, I would really, really appreciate that. <laughs> okay. We're on record. She's yes. on record. Thank you in advance. Like the fans. Yes. Uh, <laughs> next, before we run out of too much time, I'm going to go to Randall Kettner's yeah. question. And thank you for the question. Randall asked you, he's a Lyceum mm -hmm. director, Abigail, do you have any suggestions to help further reduce the number of people being incarcerated? Mm -hmm. Should any of the laws that led to greater incarceration be repealed or changed? That's a tough question. And, you know, it was interesting trying to funnel the research to focus on the business of incarceration, also take into account budget cuts of 2020, take into account social unrest of 2020, right? And really being able to create policy recommendations that fit in all of those categories. You know, I, from speaking with a lot of, of the professionals I worked, worked with, you know, I think they really promote state jail reform. I think that was definitely something that came up pretty commonly. And again, that kind of ironically goes back to that mental health piece. So with those 1993 penal code changes, yes, it did double the mandatory minimums for violent offenders, but it also created this new state jail felony, which the goal was to be able to, you know, have this place that had rehabilitation programs really focused on substance use and mental health. And a lot of the comments that we've received is maybe those services were not necessarily as robust as we would have liked them to be, and we see recidivism rates highest with these state jail offenses, which ironically also are drug offenses. Yeah. So really being able to, when we start coordinating mental health efforts, you know, the vast majority of those with a mental health condition have a co-occurring disorder with substance use. So in a lot of people who have a substance use disorder are, you know, trying to self-medicate from the symptoms they have from mental illness. So really yeah. making sure that we have opportunities available for individuals across the state to be able to 
um, have access to mental health care. It was something we talked about briefly um, in our policy brief was Texas has one of the highest um, mental health professional shortages. 73% of counties in wow. Texas don't have a psychiatrist. So when we're looking at, you know, even just rural communities and ironically the highest incarceration rates in Texas are also in rural counties. I don't think that is probably by happenstance. So how do we prevent that from happening? How do we provide more support after release? Um, a, a lot of that is continuing to invest in treatment, com continuing to invest in robust community supervision options, and really rallying your community to reduce the stigma associated with offenders and provide a more um, beneficial environment from them to walk into instead of feeling stigmatized and isolated. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. We've got just a few minutes and I, uh, I'm going to sort of combine two questions mm -hmm. and let you just real quick kind of right. lightning answer. <laughs> uh, we're going to go to Mustafa out of Houston, uh, one of our uh, esteemed directors. He asked, is there a consensus building around uh, the country on criminal justice reform in Texas, it seems the biggest problems, he says, in mental health are, you know, mm -hmm. what are so, some of the solutions? And I think he's absolutely right. And so I think that's a good sort of primer. I want to go to, mm -hmm. lastly, uh, Esteban Lopez, as I was sharing, uh, I know you're in your final year. You're my Lyceum daddy, uh, Texas Lyceum <laughs> family daddy. And so I uh, want to make sure I acknowledge you uh, as, uh, as my father, if you will, uh, has Texas consider compassionate release hmm. systems to allow inmates with serious medical conditions and mental health disorders to be released in order to receive treatment outside of the correctional system and care of their families. And this is a question out of, um, out of San Antonio. Uh, hmm. Both of those are statements, but then I am seeing a question, it looks like from State Representative Carl Sherman, hmm. <laughs> which I feel like we must, uh, Carl, thank you so much for joining us uh, and thank you for all you do for our state. Mm -hmm. He's a state representative out of the Dallas area. Uh, let's ask this question real quick and then we'll, we'll close. Mm -hmm. um, thank you Esteban and Mustafa for your statements. Um, uh, Abigail, before I get to Representative Sherman's mm -hmm. question, do you have anything uh, to, real quick to Mustafa and Esteban, mm -hmm. maybe some top line uh, responses so they're uh, to their comments. Sure. And, you know, I think we're in an interesting era where mental health is becoming top of mind. Even 10 years ago, I feel like legislators as well as just citizens were not taking um, mental health concerns as seriously. You know, one of the biggest issues that we see is this problem in continuity of care. So after release, they do have a provider then translating to their local mental health authority. That be can become a very confusing process. And even if they're on, if they have a severe mental health condition, they're on you know, some antipsychotic medications, just a day without that valuable medication makes a, huge, makes a huge impact. So how do we make sure that we're strengthening that referral system? How are we communicating from in prison to after they get out to make sure that there is not a lag in service. Um, and then to, let's see, what was the- So uh, representative, the, yes. Est Esteban? Uh, Esteban, yes. he asked about compassionate yes. release. And, release. Yes, sorry, and I'll make that super quick. Um, but you know, yeah, we see the aging population, that was something that got brought up over and over again as why medical expenditures have increased 41% since 2012. And you know, when we look at, yes, we have a, a very age, aging population that does come with increased healthcare costs. So if we are looking at a program that could potentially release some inmates that aren't necessarily a danger to society anymore, even if they have committed a violent offense, I think that is something that some legislators are pushing for. I know in Texas, we definitely have some roots and tough on crime, especially when it comes to aggravated offenses. So we have unfortunately not seen that take on too much traction in Texas, but I think we're going to continue to watch those numbers increase as far as healthcare expenditures for that aging population and trying to figure out some alternatives. Okay. Mm -hmm. And with that, we're going to uh, mm -hmm. take the last question from mm -hmm. State Representative Carl Sherman, who asks, uh, Abigail, to you, could you address the data regarding Texas being one of the five states that does not compensate the prison population for labor performed mm -hmm. inside the prison? Sure. Moreover, could you share with us the financial impact that compensation for labor of $1 an hour proposed during the 86th legislative session, which I know you did mm -hmm. look at in your research, would have on TDCJ's budget? Uh, please provide any insight on states that do pay 
prisoners for labor? Sure. So that's becoming, again, an increasingly um, pro more proposed solution across the state with unpaid layer labor becoming you know, re a really contentious aspect of the national dialogue surrounding prison operations and prison labor. And yes, there was legislation that did propose paying inmates a very small amount. However, what that would have done with Texas Department of Criminal Justice's budget is, I, and I'm again, I should know these numbers by heart, so forgive me. Again, this is a nice plug to go read my actual policy brief where <laughs> these are written out. Um, but you know, it was yeah. almost $80 million that Texas Correctional Industries profited. And if we were to pay inmates even a very small amount per day, that would have decreased the Texas Department or Texas Correctional Industries profit um, by, I believe, around $40 million. In, you know, when we look at, yes, it is difficult that we have this organization that is profiting off of prison labor, but I know the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, that, that's a big amount for them to lose that they might have been relying on treatment programs or mental health care or vocational training, right? So I, I know, unfortunately, that has not been an advantageous policy solution currently to compensate these inmates, even though I definitely think that should be considered as much as possible. Being able to provide a financial foundation for inmates after release is an invaluable solution to promote reentry, to promote stable employment, to be able to um, provide for their families and have more familial connections. So definitely doing whatever we can to consider that in the future is something that's really significant. Well, thank you, Abigail. Mm -hmm. I know we have more questions. Uh, what we'll try to do, uh, we'll work with the SAM team uh, mm -hmm. to get those questions. And mm -hmm. Abigail, maybe you can get back to these people individually. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. thank you so much for your questions. But before you, we leave you or you leave us, mm -hmm. whatever the best term is here in Lubbock, uh, we just want to, it's a cute, few housekeeping reminders mm -hmm. and thank yous most mm -hmm. of all. The first mm -hmm. is to thank Johnson Controls. Uh, they are a conference sponsor today. We are so grateful to you, our gold, silver, bronze, uh, and all our sponsors for all your support of the Lyceum. I also want to take a personal, uh, say a personal thanks to SunWest Communications Director uh, Creighton Webb and his team. You will see there has been a lot of media and communications around Abigail's work and that is thanks to SunWest, who is also a top sponsor of the Lyceum. So thank you for bringing this to life and really amplifying this research. Um, the other thing we want to remind everybody, there is a virtual hospitality suite at four o'clock mm -hmm. today. You should have the details in your inbox. If not, please reach out to Sam. Um, also want to let you know, we have a board meeting tomorrow. So the Lyceum, Lyceum directors and alum at 10 a.m. We hope all of you will be able to mm -hmm. join us. Um, before we uh, kind of, and then also we want you to ask you to stay with us. Mm -hmm. We have a nine o'clock, we're gonna play a video uh, uh, showing the sort of overview of, of Abigail's research right after this. And if not, it'll be available online later. Um, so stay with us to get mm -hmm. to the next session. Uh, what you wanna do is uh, at 9 a.m. is in your browser, you'll see on the top left, something that says back to sessions. When we finish up here in Lubbock, you wanna click on that in the top left, back to sessions, and that will take you to um, the next session at nine. And that's gonna be an amazing panel with a, a group of uh, different folks speaking about this. And now you've got the primer set up here with <laughs> Abigail, but if you have any systems issues, please email info at texaslyceum.org. And Mary Beth and Lauren and the mm -hmm. team will make sure you're covered. And last but not least, I wanted to say very special thank you First, I'd like to start off with our Madam President, Laura Dixon. Mm -hmm. As many of you know, this is her alma mater. Mm -hmm. This was her vision to come to West Texas and to bring the fellowship to Texas Tech. And we have had a blast doing it. And so I wanna say thank you to her for your support and encouragement in making this happen. Mm -hmm. The next, uh, I wanna thank Terry Bruner, who's been a great partner, our incoming policy uh, fellowship mm -hmm. vice president, and he will do an amazing job. Uh, it has been a blast working with you. Uh, but keeping the thanks now, taking it back to Texas mm -hmm. Tech, we have to thank the Texas mm -hmm. Tech system and the Tex Texas Tech University um, president, uh, Skubanek, uh, <laughs> it was great. And, and you came on board to support Abigail and the work in our partnership with them. So thank you, Alicia Knight, our uh, extraordinary alumni VP, alumni in general, uh, cannot, I'm at a loss for words. Um, Alicia has just been great. Uh, 
uh, and, and making magic happen here at Texas Tech. And so I want to make sure she knows thank you as well. And Christina Butts, 2020 uh, Lyceum Director, also here at Texas Tech, has been great um, helping us maneuver and everything. And then I've got to thank the crew here at our <laughs> arena, Chris Cook and David Hoagland and everybody <laughs> here for um, making this, for getting this to you and getting us out to you. Um, they have been uh, great. And so um, thank you to everybody, uh, tech, Lyceum director, supporters, um, y'all have been, and how could I forget, Dr. Nathaniel Wright, <laughs> who uh, led us in this research, uh, MPA professor and head of the department here. Thank you all um, to our Lyceum directors, alum, and guests. Stay with us. We've got more to come, and we've enjoyed talking with you and enjoyed all the feedback mm -hmm. from Lubbock. So have a great day, everyone, and see you later at the hospitality suite or at the board meeting tomorrow. That's all we've got. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. They probably did. The business of incarceration. The Texas prison system has undergone dramatic changes over the past 40 years, with significant shifts in incarceration rates and consequent changes in the infrastructure and complexity of prison operations. Rapid prison population growth of 541% in the late 1980s led to significantly expanded government partnerships with private corporations for prison construction and service provision, thus creating the business of incarceration. As a result, administrators and legislators face challenges to ensure accountability, coordination, and efficiency among numerous organizations with conflicting goals. Private interests infiltrating the Texas justice system sparks fierce debate amongst policymakers about the ethics of profiting from incarceration, as well as high recidivism rates for state prisoners. To address these challenges, we must first look at the current state and trends of the Texas justice system to identify key areas of potential impact. Beginning in 2011, incarceration rates in Texas have steadily declined, with 2018 reflecting the lowest rate in 30 years. Despite this decline, correction spending has increased 17% to record highs of nearly $3 billion, accounting for 82% of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice's total expenditures. The number of offenders in private prisons decreased by 60%, but budget allocations to prison corporations only reduced by 13%. Healthcare expenses alone have increased by 41% since 2011, with the percentage of inmates 50 years and older quadrupling since 1975. Psychiatric services represent nearly half of all healthcare spending, with over half of all incarcerated adults in the United States diagnosed with at least one mental health condition. The prison system is the nation's number one mental health provider. The Texas prison system relies on numerous private vendors to supply the goods and services necessary for prison operations, including utilities, technology, maintenance, transportation, surveillance, healthcare, and commissary. During 2018, the TDCJ Contracts and Procurement Department processed 46,400 purchase orders. When Texas correctional industries began in 1963, their objectives were to provide work program participants with marketable job skills, help reduce recidivism, and reduce department costs by providing products and services to TDCJ and other eligible entities. In 2018, TCI sales generated over $76 million in profit, in addition to the significant cost savings of utilizing prisoners to produce products and services at $0 wages. Private interests embedded in the industry of incarceration generate economic and ethical challenges, as private prison companies paid lobbyists nearly $500,000 in 2017 to secure contracts amidst a shrinking market. Approaching the 87th legislative session, significant economic uncertainty prompted Governor Abbott to issue an immediate 5% budget reduction across all state agencies for the current biennium, with exceptions for critical government functions. The following policy recommendations center on leveraging partnerships within the industry of incarceration to enact cost-effective solutions for the successful reintegration of formerly incarcerated men and women into society. Number one, develop partnerships to capitalize privatization. While critics of privatization emphasize companies' previous failure to follow through with maintaining quality for the negotiated price, capitalizing on privatization through strategic contract negotiations ensures accountability and mutually beneficial partnerships. Number two, develop partnerships to promote employment. 46% of individuals released from Texas prisons and 63% released from state jails are rearrested. 
employment is one of the most critical and influential factors in reducing this recidivism. Targeting employers that develop trade skills and provide vocational certifications for inmates advances their economic capacity and improves their likelihood of securing a livable wage after release. Number three, develop partnerships to increase access to mental health care. 73% of Texas counties do not have a psychiatrist, creating a multifaceted challenge within the criminal justice system during and after incarceration. Developing partnerships with universities presents a cost-effective approach to coordinate additional mental health services for inmates and improve continuity of care after release. Texas administrators and legislators, while facing many challenges within the business of incarceration, can significantly impact the Texas justice system by developing these critical partnerships that provide the support most needed to reduce expenditures and ensure reentry success.